You may want to turn it up. There's some hard hearing people here tonight. So can you hear me now? Everybody can hear me. Okay, great. Well, my name is John Stroop. Um, I'm with Freeway Ministries, and it's so awesome to have uh, Jacob and Kelly Lasher uh, share uh, lead in song in a mother-son uh, duo, which is awesome. I'm jealous because we're not talented that way in my family, but uh, we, we have a table outside of the, the hallway there, and there's a couple books that I wrote, um, and it, we sell them, and the, that money goes to my wife and I, but I will tell you that I give them away to people who want one. So if you're here and you want a book and you can't afford a book, I'll give you a book. Uh, if you have a family member struggling and you don't know how a friend, how to help them, and you're struggling with enabling them, we have a book for that. And uh, so I don't want anyone to leave without one if you want one, okay? So you stop by. We have resources there. We have newsletters. Uh, stuff like that we can send to people in prison and uh, we have a sign up list you can get on our our email list and we love to just continue to share what God is doing in people's lives like Will um, so it's it's very very exciting time for me to be in a new church I've never been here before um, we've always wanted to plant a freeway in, in this area and so my job is to plant outreaches alongside local churches uh, to reach the hard to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ we see people that are uh, struggling with addiction, poverty, and crime as a people group. And many times, uh, that's a generational thing. It's three generations, four generational crime, addiction, and poverty. And we see ourselves as missionaries sent to those areas to reach those people through the local church. And then we have homes, recovery homes, called discipleship houses. We have around 50 men and women living in southern Missouri. Um, fully employed, paying taxes, members of local churches, uh, being discipled mentors, and serving in the community. And, uh, and so that's my job. That's what I get to do. Uh, I love it. I don't feel like it's work, and, and I get to preach. And so here I am tonight. So thank you for inviting me, Pastor Kyle. Uh, let's ask God to bless this meeting. We, we'll start with prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, uh, that you're a faithful God. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. Um, I don't get some things about your nature, Lord. I can't fathom the way you hear all of our prayers all over the world, but you're attentive to them. And, uh, Father, I just pray that you would listen tonight and, and uh, do me a favor, and you would move in this crowd. And I always pray, surprise me, Lord. I don't want this to be just another Sunday night meeting. I'm asking you, God, to do something special. I'm asking you, God, to do in moments what years of counseling can't do, to do in moments what drugs can't do, what jail cells and prisons can't do, what religion can't do, that you would revive your church, and that if there's somebody here tonight that's lost without Jesus, that you would bring a dead thing to life, and, and we, would not, we would not have a church mask on. We would take them off right now, and we would get real. And so, God, would you pour out your spirit on us tonight? Would you help us prepare our hearts for, for what you have in store? And, and, God, I'm asking that you would help me preach like a dying man to a dying people, that you would help me be unafraid and brave and preach boldly about your son Jesus and his nature. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you can and you would, find your place to Luke chapter 15. And the title of the message is Lost and Found. Lost and found. And so when you find Luke 15, if you would do me another favor, and I'm asking a lot out of you, uh, would you stand to honor God's words? It's read. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Man, that's such a very important verse. And the Pharisees and scribes complained and said, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Then he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them, saying, What man among you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go out and, to, and find the one which he's lost? Go out to the, find the one which he's lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which I lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Wow. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses a coin, 
doesn't go out, doesn't light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thank you. You can have a seat. There are two things in this life that I really struggle with. And I'm telling you tonight, I'm a one-talent guy, okay? I'm not, I'm not a fixer-upper. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a mechanic. I just got one thing I can do, and, and that's preach. But I have a lot of struggles, and I'll, I'll just name two of them. I'm directionally challenged. Is there anybody else in here who can say they're directionally challenged tonight? One, one honest person. Okay, there we go, Kelly. You get, does anybody get lost easy? You get lost easy? I get lost easy. I, I've been in Springfield since 2009, and I took the city bus for two years, uh, almost two years before I got a license, got a car, started my life over in a homeless shelter. And, um, and, and, and I've been there since 2009, and I still use the GPS sometimes in Springfield, Missouri because I'm directionally challenged. I get lost easy. I use a GPS for everything. I get turned around more than most people, but I feel like I'm the best driver I know, amen? <laughs> I feel like I'm a better driver than my wife, and, and, uh, but, I, but I also lose things. Does anybody else here lose things? You lose things? I don't have my keychain on me, but it's got a hook. And I hook my keychain on my belt, and I walk around like a janitor because I know that if I don't have my keychains on my, on my belt, I, my hook, then I'll lose them, right? I lose my wallet. I lose my preaching notes. I, use valuable, I lose valuable things. I, I lose my, oldest, my youngest son, my teenage son, Keith. I've lost him in church several times. I drive off, and, he, and, and, and then I realize I've left him at church. And, and sometimes people come to me and they'll have something important to give me. And I'll say, is that important? And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, give it to Sharla, my wife, because she doesn't lose things like I lose things. But then I tell my wife that the things I lose, I really don't lose because I find 99% of the things I think I lose. So I just misplace them. Amen? I wonder if there's anybody here the same. Every business, every church has an, a place for those things. You know what it's called? The lost and found. I guarantee you have a lost and found probably here at the church, right? Full of stuff in the kitchen, cups everywhere. Back to, whose cups are these, right? And, and, and so what is a lost and found? It's a place where valuable things have, are waiting to be found by their owner. That's what we see here in Scripture. See, it's a parable. What's a parable? Well, I think a parable is a shadow. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that represents something else. It's an earthly story to represent a heavenly truth. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's teaching from a parable. So who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees come into the picture, and they're criticizing Jesus. And you know why they're criticizing Jesus? Because Jesus is sitting with the worst people society has to offer. They're criticizing him. The religious crowd is criticizing Jesus because he's having a meal with people that the religious crowd would never have a meal with. Jesus is being accused of receiving and eating with sinners. Who's in, the, who's in the story? The tax collectors are there. Who are the tax collectors? The tax collectors are the thieves, the extortioners, the betrayers of their own people. They were marked as unclean and they couldn't even worship. And then they were the sinners. Who are the sinners? They were immoral people. They were people who broke God's law. They were the outcasts, the dreads, the marginalized of society. I'm going to give you a context. The context of Luke chapter 15 is Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, Jesus is teaching in, about being a fully obedient follower of Christ. He's talking about counting the cost of discipleship. He gives these illustrations about building a tower and not, not counting the cost of the materials and being halfway done. And he's, he tells a story about a war and, and how if you go to war, you think about how many soldiers you have and how many soldiers the enemy has. And then he says this. He, said, he, says, he says, you're the salt of the earth. And he says, if salt loses its flavor, what shall it be good for? Nothing to be fall, thrown down and trampled by men. But look at the last verse of chapter 14. It's neither fit for the land nor the dunghill, but men throw it out. Now listen to this very carefully. 
this will open the parable up to you in a new way. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 1 of 15. And then the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Wow. Who had ears to hear? The tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. We have three things that get lost. There's a sheep, a coin, and a wasteful son. Two things are lost on their own, and one thing is lost because of the fault of another. And there's three words in these parables that are ringing over and over again, lost, found, and rejoicing. So I want to give you some simple take-homes that will inspire you, motivate you, and hopefully bring revival in your life. The first thing is this. I want to talk about the nature of Jesus. History teaches that rabbis would, would, would teach their students that, G, that God would forgive people who sought forgiveness. But Jesus comes, he flips the apple cart upside down, and he says God is seeking to forgive sinners. Not, not a, listen, not that sinners are seeking to be forgiven, that God forgives people who seek forgiveness, but, but, but Jesus says that he's seeking to forgive, that he wants, <laughs> he's looking to forgive sinners. I love what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15. This, this is something that is near to me, coming from the background I come from. He says this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of us all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into this world to, to, to save sinners of who I am, the chief. Paul said, I'm the worst. Wow. I love Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Same context. Jesus says this. Now it happened as he was dining at Levi's house. Now here he is with the worst people society has that offer. He's with a converted tax collector. And then all the tax collectors are there and the sinners are there. And they're eating with Jesus and his disciples. And it says there was many of them and they followed Jesus. And then the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with the tax collectors and sinners. And he said, they said, the Pharisees say to Jesus' disciples, how is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said this, verse 17, Mark chapter 2. Jesus heard it and he said to them, those who have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance. We see the nature of Jesus. He uses the illustration of a shepherd, but there's no, the word shepherd isn't in this text. It's not there, but everyone knew what he's talking about. One gets lost from a hundred, and he speaks of a shepherd. And the shepherd begins to search, and, and he finds that sheep that was stray. And then there's a woman and it's very interesting, if you're a Bible nerd, you like to take notes, the woman loses one of ten. The shepherd loses one of a hundred. And he says, what woman among you that loses a piece of jewelry that would be, in my opinion, like a modern-day wedding ring? It was a garland, and there would be a ten-piece band that went around their head, and one of the ten coins was missing. And this woman went after it. Now, I want to show you something here. Look how Jesus places every man and every woman in the story. What man among you who loses a sheep we can go and look for his sheep until he finds it? What woman among you who loses her wedding ring we can go and look for your wedding ring until you find it? Why does Jesus do that? Why is Jesus placing every man and every woman in the story? Because a woman would have special value on her wedding ring. A special value. It would be precious to this woman. And a shepherd, oh, I'm a, I have a hobby farm and I have cows, believe it or not, from the hood. And I've got cows. That's a true story. But I'm looking for them every day. I go out there. It's my therapy. 
And if one was lost, I'm looking. Because to me, they're valuable. Place yourself there for a moment. Jesus, God in the flesh. He's sitting in the middle of the most rejected, marginalized, sinful, hated people society had to offer. And they have ears to hear. <laughs> Jesus stops teaching them. Listen, they're eating together. The Pharisees are talking. Jesus is talking, having a meal, and speaking to the Pharisees who are at some distance away. And he starts to tell a parable. If this was today's society, as we speak right now, there would, there would be people around Jesus. And guess what, church? They'd have tattoos. The guy to the left would have a parole officer, and the guy to the right would have a GPS monitor on his ankle. The people would have extremely long criminal records. They would smell like cigarettes. Some would be homeless and drunk and coming down off drugs. Some would be local bad guys with bad reputations. And Jesus, the Son of God, would be sitting in the middle of these people, having a meal with these people. And he stops and he looks at the religious crowd. And you know what he says? How valuable are they to you? How valuable? That's exactly the message Jesus is teaching here. The nature of Jesus is seen in this text. Wow. How would a homeless person be treated if they walked through the door with a shopping cart this evening? As a first time guest, how valuable are they to you? I will never forget when we started Freeway Ministries at Broadway Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm getting a little loose, so you might stone me, you might tell me never to come back again. But I'm just so glad Jesus got a hold of me before the Baptist did. I'm gonna be honest with you today. When I, got, when, when, I, when, I, when I went to Broadway Baptist Church, I was a part of a Pentecostal organization. I was part of an outreach at an Assemblies of God church, and I didn't even know I was Baptist. But, but I got saved reading the Bible. I wanted to know what Jesus did with bad guys because I was one. And I got out of prison, fell in love with the Lord, got plugged in from a missionary who wrote me in prison and, and started going to church with him. And I used to make fun of Baptist people. I had one Baptist friend. His name was Baptist Rick is what I called him. And, and, and so, so I, me and my son, we bought a purple van. And that purple van said Ozark Assemblies of God on it with gold letters on the side of it. And me and my son, I got custody of him when I got out of prison. He was two and a half years old. And, and he's, he's three years old. We started a van ministry, and we'd pick homeless people up and take them to church. And, and, and I met with Brother Eddie Bumpers from Broadway Baptist Church, who's now Crossway Baptist Church. And, and I started having problems with theology and started realizing, hey, I don't line up with these folks here. And, and so I left the church with my son, and I've met a guy, and we, a couple guys, and they introduced me to Brother Eddie. And I said, man, listen, I got an idea. I've been in a ministry, and that we could do this and that. And, and I said, but the people we're after are going to smell bad. And they, 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 they're not going to know your church rules. But there's a people group that needs to be reached. And, and we want to start an outreach on the weekends. And, and, uh, and, and he said, man, there's three vans. There's a building back there. If you ever outgrow that building, we'll, we'll help you get another one. And so we started Freeway Ministries. And, and, and I'm, I'm just telling you this. We offer a meal and a message and clothing. And, and we invite them to church. And then the demographic of Broadway Baptist Church started to change. And these folks here were there, and they can tell you firsthand how it was. And I can't help tell the story about the purple van. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a van full of homeless people. A purple van with Ozark Assemblies of God on the side of it, with me driving with a three-year-old in a car seat, full of homeless people like a bass fisherman that caught the trophy catch, roll into a Southern Baptist church, conservative Southern Baptist church on Sunday morning with a purple van that said Ozark Assemblies of God on the side of it. But it's a sight to see. <laughs> and, and you know what happened? Man, we'd go pick people up. And there was a homeless man named Robert. And he lived in a woods on Kearney in 65. He was mentally, he had some mental issues and he wanted to live homeless, but he loved to come to church. In our outreaches, we, we have transportation. And then on, we say, if you don't have a home church, we'd like to invite you to. And we go pick them up and take them to that local partner church. 
Well, Robert lived in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tent city type thing on the corner of, of Kearney and 65 by the old hot waffle house that's now a car lot. And there was a rock, and if you walk down that path, there's a homeless camp. And Robert's the only one that wanted to go to church on Sunday. And Robert would take his Bible, and he'd walk up that hill, and he'd walk through that, that parking lot on Sunday morning. And he'd stand on Kearney and 65, and we'd pull up and pick him up. And I don't know what it's like to be a waitress at the Waffle House and see a homeless man come out of the woods carrying his Bible on Sunday morning and have a church bus pick him up and then take him back and drop him off. But you know what happened? Robert joined the choir. <laughs> Robert joined the choir. And now he's at a, he's a, he's a Crossway Baptist Church in the choir praising the Lord in the choir, singing in the choir, going on Wednesday night to choir practice, living in the woods behind the Waffle House. But then it got better because the, 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 the Green County Commissioner, Harold Bench, at the time bought Robert a three-piece suit with a tie. Now, I don't know what it's like to work at the Waffle House on Sunday morning as a waitress and see a man in a three-piece suit with a tie and a Bible come walking out of the woods on Sunday morning and stand on the side of the road and have a purple bus that says, Ozark Assemblies of God to take him to a Baptist church. But you know what happened? Revival. God broke loose. You know why? Because they had the nature of Jesus. They had the nature of Jesus. The nature of Jesus. What is it? To seek and to save that which is lost. And I want you to take this second thing home. You say, it's hot. I'm the one doing the work. So just hang in there, amen? I want to talk about the Christian responsibility. Look at the effort of the shepherd. Look at the effort of the woman. The shepherd counts his sheep through his crook, and he sees that there's one missing, and he counts them for the third time. There should be 100. Now there's 99, and he goes on the hunt, and he searches, and... He finds that lost, stubborn, rebellious, hard-headed, knucklehead sheep. And, and, and he looks through the valley and, and he searches the forest and then he climbs the mountains and he finds the one. And then the woman. The woman realizes her ring is missing, her coin is missing, a piece of, a recognized uh, part of her wedding, her, her memory of her wedding, her commitment to her husband. And she starts to search the house. She's looking in the, she's looking in the mirror before bedtime like a lot of you ladies do, and I don't know why you do that, right? Uh, men don't get their hair fixed before they lay down and go to bed. We just go to bed. But sometimes ladies like to look in the mirror for a minute. This woman realizes that her, her coin is missing, and, and she begins to look through her house. And, and, and so she, she looks through the house, and she can't find the coin so she lights the lamp and she searches and she still can't find the coin and she's sweating she's frustrated she refuses to give up and she grabs her broom and she searches until she captures the coin when I was a bad guy I'm from Jeff City Missouri and I'm not proud of this but I was a bad guy and I was a drug addict and I was homeless and a needle junkie and everything you can imagine I come from generational crime and addiction and and uh, I, was, I was on the run from the, from the Fugitive Task Force, and, and I was, I, I was, they was looking for me. They was hunting me down, and one time I run from trailer to trailer to trailer in the outside of Jeff City, and there was a little boy, five years old, standing at the door, and I knocked on the door, and I noticed he had a Ninja Turtle pajama out, outfit on, and, and I knew his parents, and, and so I knocked on the door, he opened the door, and I said, hey, little boy, I'm a ninja. I said, Master Splinter sent me. Uh, I, I, said, I, said, I said, hide me. And he said, come on in. And this little boy took me to his room and he put me in his closet because the police was looking for me. And then not too long after that, the closet flies open and there's the police. You know why? You know how they found me? He gave me up. Yeah. Little boy dropped a dime on me. You want to know why? Because they was hunting me down. Why am I telling you a dumb story about, about the police chasing me? It's because we need to be like that. We have a responsibility. Who's Jesus preached the gospel to in this community? Who invites people to church in this community? God's people, us. We have a responsibility to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. That's our calling. We as the body of Christ should never stop hunting and witnessing and sharing 
the gospel with people. I want to encourage you tonight. Use your lamps. I want to encourage you tonight. Grab your broom and make every effort to hunt and evangelize your community because Jesus taught us that every lost person is worth rejoicing in heaven. Every single lost person. When the church of Jesus Christ spends more money on decorating buildings than they do reaching the lost, we have a spiritual problem. Jesus said we should reach the lost. We should hunt people down. That should be our nature. God doesn't use lazy people, church. The woman was hardworking. She was not lazy. The, sheep, the shepherd was hardworking. He was not lazy. That's a picture of Jesus. And my last point is salvation should bring rejoicing. Jesus says that every sinner is worth rejoicing. Every lost person who repents is worth rejoicing in the presence of God. Think about that. Think about that for a minute. I want you just to imagine, what's that like? What's it like? What is the rejoicing like in heaven when one person that society sees as not worthy, one person that, that everyone's counted out, one, one unrighteous church member, because you're no better than a junkie. I'm just going to tell you like that. You're just as bad as they are. You're, you're a sinner just like they are. What happens when one person repents? What's it like? Well, he shows us what it's like. Listen, don't miss this. In heaven, verse 9, it's like this. She calls her friends, and she rejoices because she's found what she has lost. Likewise, just like that. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Remember the context for a moment. Remember the context of this parable. Listen, who's listening to the parable? Picture this for a moment. I just want to give you an idea of what's happening as we close. Jesus is defending the fact that he's evangelizing and fellowshipping with the most hated people society had to offer. Can you see it? Jesus eating with them. The Pharisees over here, they won't get close to one of those people, so they're not at the table. Jesus is reclining at the table and having a meal with these people. The Pharisees are over here far away, and Jesus is speaking loud enough for everyone to hear. He sets his fork down in the middle of a fellowship dinner, a, pa a Baptist potluck, amen? He's got a little bit of everything on his plate. He looks over at the Pharisees, and he tells these parables. Now, let me ask you a question. Who heard him? Think about it. It wasn't the Pharisees. It was them. <laughs> now, can you imagine them looking at each other? They say, wait a minute. I get it. He's talking about me. I have value. I'm worth looking for. Hold on a minute. I'm the coin. Wait a minute. I'm the son. We're the son. We're the sheep. You mean God's looking to forgive me? Hey. You mean I have value to God? Me? Man. What's left for everyone listening to do? Repent and believe the message. There is more rejoicing. There is more rejoicing in heaven. Listen, guys, over one sinner who gets baptized. It's not what it says. Over one sinner who signs a Baptist covenant. Over one sinner who joins a church. Listen, don't miss this. Over one sinner who repents. Turning from their sins and placing their faith that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came down and fulfilled every law I broke. Hey, he never, he, he got thirsty and hungry and tired and weary for the first time. 
he went to the cross and as the perfect son of God, God poured his wrath out on him and my sin was justified in Jesus Christ and he rose. That's the message. All they had to do was believe. Have you done that? Maybe you're the guy with a GPS monitor on your ankle tonight. Maybe you're the religious person that crosses your arms and sticks your chest out and throws stones at homeless people. And you forget, big boy, that if it wasn't for the grace of God, there you go. Maybe you're the church member that says, you know what? I'm so tired of playing church. I want something real. I need revival, God. 